May I ask Professor Dr. Klaus Peter Ernst give him a big hand. He's a professor of Information Systems and Business Administration of the Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences. Klaus Peter Ernst teaches business IT and management at the Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences, focusing on e-business. His research concentrates on technology acceptance, social media, cloud computing, project management, and business process outsourcing. Then please welcome Erik Potzubait, CEO and founder of Scalable AG. Erik is experienced in finance and building digital business models. He was a co-CEO for the German business of West Wing Home and Living before he has spent seven years as an executive director with Goldman Sachs in London and Frankfurt, advising financial institutes and capital investment and taking care of an electronic trading platform. So he's been a banker. And now I developed something which will extinguish bankers, so they are no use anymore. That's a thrilling story. He'll have to prove it. Dr. Peter Kürpik, Executive Vice President, Product House Unify. He leads the Product House of Unify and is a member of the senior executive team. He takes care of the portfolio strategy and innovations. He is leading worldwide teams of software development. Before, he has been in leading positions of some renowned players like SAP and Software AG. He has published over 100 papers on supercomputing, physics, chemistry, and environmental sciences. He has a doctor of theoretical physics, a master in environmental Protocol. science, an MBA of INSEAD, and a Heinz Meyer Leibniz Award. Great to have him here. And you understand him when he actually talks. <laughs> I did understand him when we talked before, which, you <laughs> know, I was language. scared I wouldn't. <laughs> and uh, now you'll recognize Andrew Filev, to whom you've been listening uh, this morning already. Please welcome him. CEO and founder of Rike, a cloud-based work management platform. It supports team productivity. Over 10,000 companies in 120 countries use Reich, and we've seen a lovely video, which I've seen online before, where uh, his clients say why, that's, why it, 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 it enhances their work when they use that kind of problem. Now, I would like to ask every one of you to answer the first question, to what extent has digitization already transformed your company. Let's start here. Um, so Andrew. for us, it didn't just transform. We're, um, it's our bread and butter. We were born for the digital work. Uh, we help um, more than 10,000 paid customers, but we're used by more than 2 million users worldwide right now and help them really move faster in this digital um, environment. I mean, we have gone uh, as Unify company with still you know, about 5,000 people. Um, we are completely virtualized workforce, okay? So all, all our offices are, you know, like, as you go, you use the office space. You don't have a fixed space anymore. So the whole communication in our case is completely digitized and it's completely kind of virtualized in the sense that we, we work in with similar tools as, as, as you do. Um, the whole communication is based on, you know, soft phones, uh, you know, app-based, etc. So that element of digitization in the communication is an element that is that is very strong in any kind of knowledge worker driven company. Okay. Lucas, may I ask you to maybe raise the monitor if we have one here so that we hear our voices a little better. It's not necessary to be louder for them, but it would be necessary to be louder for us. Otherwise I don't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Eric. Um I mean digital technology is um really the um the number one reason why we exist in the first place. Yeah, it's, we are a fintech company and um, uh, through that we can attract a customer base that banks can't attract. Yeah, we, so we're not competing with their old customers, we're rather competing with the customers of the future. And it also allows us to scale in a way that it, we wouldn't be able to, to do in the, uh, in the classic mainframe world of the banking industry. Professor Ernst. 
So since I'm teaching in higher education, digitalization changed what we teach. I'm an information systems professor, as well as how we teach. So such as providing slides online, but also teaching lectures online. So digitalization is a large part of my daily life and also the daily life of my students, which are, as you may call them, my customers. So a big part. Mr. Holz. In my point of view, it's, uh, digitalization is not so much about technology, it's more about culture. And we try to incorporate this in our company. It's a very small company, 12 employees. We're a startup looking for money here on the CBIT, but we are already distributed uh, to San Francisco to, uh, at Bali. Bali is a very good uh, place for developers, um, much better than Bangalore, you might uh, uh, imagine. And we try to implement the processes that they are really working for digitalization, working around the clock, for example, working uh, on completely different places. Can you give examples of companies that profited from digitization? Dr. Kirpik. Companies that? Profited from digitization. I mean, <laughs> a lot of companies pro profit from digitization. I mean, it's, it, it starts with the classic order to cash process. And I think we have done that for the last 10 years. Yeah? I mean, it's not, digitization didn't start yesterday, and you know, it starts some, sure. some years back. And uh, a lot of the companies here in the, in the, in the, in the hallways have, have made this happen. What's missing from, from our perspective, or what when we see at Unify, is the aspect of the human. And I'll give you one example. And I think any one of you would agree. Um, if you uh, work in virtual teams across the planet, the way you work is you do a, you know, use a tool, you might use screen sharing, you do all of that, but the voice part and the audio part, uh, the video part, is still completely disconnected. So you're on the phone with a party that is somewhere on the other side of the planet and you would be talking about you know, what's, what you guys see on the screen. Is there any correlation? There's no correlation. No correlation whatsoever today. And that's one of the, the, the topics we're working on, because we're saying um, the digitization doesn't stop there where you have digitized all the processes, all the machines are talking, but the humans among themselves are still basically isolated from what's happening there. So you need some degree of, of correlation where you say after a week, we talked last week about this topic, who was in the meeting, who talked about what, maybe it's recorded, maybe it's, you know, it's even case sensitive to the documents and the project management system I was talking to, right? So I have a, a complete integration. That doesn't exist anywhere today, right? But this is going to exist because people feel that they will be more efficient working together. Is that yes, what because you how, how often do we sit in a call in larger companies, you know, banks, etc. you sit in a call, 25 people in a call, two guys talking or three, the others you hear them typing on their, on their laptops, and then sometimes somebody gets a question and he goes, on mute, yes, I agree, mute. Highly inefficient way of working. Highly inefficient. And most of the large companies today work like that. So that, that, that part of, of, of all the interaction between humans has not been cut or, or, or transformed. There's no transformation happening there today, but it's going to happen. Can you, uh, do companies come to your mind who we know, may know as consumers and uh, do you happen to have an example of a company that where digitization changed the way they work and in a way that I as a consumer felt often it's business to business stuff and we don't even notice but maybe yeah there there's no. there companies which I um, you know, take Sephora I mean the, the the cosmetics brand for example or take take Burberry um, for example, Burberry, what they did from what I um, recall is they said it doesn't matter whether you buy where we encounter you, which is a, a super uh, change in the way you sell. You know, if somebody comes in a shop, the person normally in the shop wants to sell to that person at that place. Yes. Burberry said it doesn't matter. You can leave the shop, we'll catch you anywhere, and at one point we'll sell to you. Right? So, just to, to do this needs a huge, you know, transformation because you need to, if you don't sell in the shop, you, you do it because you know, I'm going to track this customer anywhere. I'm going to catch him at the airport, I'm going to catch him on duty-free shop, I'm going to, yeah, ex or on, online. So I'm so sure that I know everything about this person because of digital transformation that it doesn't matter to buy here. That's a huge shame. That's one example. So Fora mm -hmm. does, you know, similar thing where... Uh, you know, you also kind of, you're always close to the customer. 
you know, virtually close. Professor, do you have some examples of companies that work so differently since they introduced digitization? I think all companies that do um, some kind of marketing have been changed how they do their things. So like uh, search engine optimization, search engine marketing or social media marketing are things that simply weren't there like 10 to 15 years ago. They just came up recently. And when I take a look at what my students tell me, how they consume media, less and more and less of people of them are actually watching TV, they're watching Netflix or they're watching YouTube. Mm. So this changes how you can reach this target, cube, the target group. Ten years ago, you would um, like do some TV commercials and you would reach your target group. Today, you have to have a whole... whole whole idea about how to reach them. Doing TV spots is not enough. Going into social media, going via Twitter, going to actually communicate with your customers, what, which was not really possible like some time, some times ago. So if you have a question, for example, Deutsche Bahn, I see it much in Facebook. If you have like my train was late, then people can actually talk to someone at Deutsche Bahn and they talk back to you. And this was not something possible like 10 years ago. You would call them and they would talk one to one. And now you're like having this possibility talking one to many, like helping people with a problem. I have a problem, please help me. And the company answers this question and each and every one who maybe has the same question or the same problem at the moment can get the information just in time and also this just in time is one big aspect of this marketing thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to add because we analyzed Deutsche Bahn mm -hmm. and they only answer on reclamations. They discard all the other information, they just say we are not interested, they, they um, act like they are not interested in their customers. They are just trying uh, to fulfill their needs and, and go on the reclamations. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the most interesting question for me is, we all need this data. My company needs this data. The question is, who owns this data? Because we now, our digital identity is distributed over many thousands of, of companies and they have all, all of them only have a little information about this. We're always talking about um, everyone only has a little part of my information except the NSA. They have everything. So, and <laughs> we wouldn't, why, why should they have this advantage? I believe mm -hmm. data should be completely public. Um, not that I would not have anything to hide. I have a lot to hide. But you I'd want to know everything about yourself, but you don't want me or your oh, brother. Yes, you can. To yes, know. you can. But I want to decide what's public data from me. I don't have any problem buying an iPhone and everyone knowing it. I even carry them around like everyone should know I have an iPhone. No, it's, it's now the big iPad Pro. I'm showing everyone I have this iPad Pro. So it's no problem for me. Uh, no, most of the data. Uh, some, some of the data I would like to have private, but I would want to be in charge of this data. Okay. What examples come to your mind where digitization really changed how they work and how they deliver better? So, uh, I'll, I'll talk about three things. One is um, we started the conversation about how the way we work changes what we deliver. Um, and one of our customers is a super cool company. They launch uh, satellites into space, microsatellites. And it'd be impossible to do a decade ago where the, you know, small uh, team do that. Uh, it's only possible when you've got sort of um, connected uh, through supply with your suppliers and experts and everything and could um, package it and ship. Um, and in the same uh, way, I, I was I, I list, uh, recently listened to um, Gosh, um, Beth, Beth uh, Comstack, um, vice chair and head of innovation at GE Speak, and she talked about transformation that GE went through in delivering... Um, GE, General Electric. General Electric, in yes. delivering their um, services and products where um, a lot of them right now has a uh, digital component. So, so and, and the biggest part of that transformation was within the company and how they do their work. So, so that's kind of one trend. We change how, they how we work and through that deliver better products faster. Um, there, another big trend that uh, um, you see very vividly is the convergence of offline and online. 
Um, and at that convergence, there is a lot of innovation and disruption. You've got companies like Uber, we talked in the morning, you know, which is banned in Germany, but uh, still a $50 billion company created almost overnight. Um, you've got Airbnb um, that you and I like and many others, right, that, that sort of disrupts the uh, hotel industry. You, you've got a lot of other companies that are created at this intersection of physical and digital. Um, and the third um, big trend that a lot of companies leverage in is better and smarter computing abilities. Uh, to be able to process a lot of data in a smart way. Um, so the amount of data grows exponentially um, and it becomes competitive advantage of how fast you can process that. I don't know if you um, watch it in the news, but Google's DeepMind is getting better and better at playing Go. Uh, so that's kind of beating Watson and the, the, I think that was their final frontier for games. Uh, and now the next frontier will be much smarter applications. But um, computers get smarter, we get better at processing the data. And so that creates a lot of opportunities. And, and again, speaking pragmatically, marketing is a great example of that, where we see a lot of real time, a lot of micro targeting, and it's all available today because of the data that underlines the data in real time technologies that underline that it was not um, available before. Dr. Kubrick, um, what should companies do first when developing that digitization strategy? Um, don't forget about your business. Um, I think that digitization has to come out of the business. I think a lot of in initiatives fail, which are what we call in Germany Stabsstelle. You know, like you have somebody dedicated, re maybe reporting to the CEO, and he's Mr. or Mrs. Digitization. And then the regular business, who carries the revenue, carries the margin, they are, you know, like instructed. I think that is for failure, honestly. You have to put it into the business. You might have then. You know, if you're in a larger corporation, you might have three or four businesses in parallel and they might compete for the best strategy. I think that's fair, you know. And then you have to reconcile at the technical level and say, okay, you know, maybe we want to do only this once you know, and not twice or three times. But if the, if the business doesn't embrace it, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult. You cannot inject it from the outside. And that might need, you know, different talents in the business. Um, and, um, and then behind comes the technology. I think a lot of these digitization pitches and, and also when you look at, you know, when you like searches for people, they're driven by technology. Do you have a guy who knows about cloud and this and Yeah, it's okay. You need to have some know-how, no doubts. But unless you know what you're talking about from a business perspective, I don't think it's, it's going to mature, right? What is your experience? I mean... <clears throat> My experience, especially in the, in the financial industry, is the, the, um, the most important thing is that you should not fear uh, cannibalizing yourself. Um, I know that sounds like a commonplace, but um, this is truly, I would say, the number one reason why a lot of incumbents don't make the step that's absolutely necessary. It's not that they don't see what's happening. It's not that they don't have the resources. They just fear that they cut off mm. their current revenue streams but it's going to happen anyway. If they don't do it themselves and change the, the, uh, the cost and the infrastructure level within their companies, someone else is going to do it. Because through technology or digitalization, you can offer uh, simply a lot of services m at a much cheaper level than you were previously able to do. However, for example, banks, they have built up a cost infrastructure where they need to charge a lot. Not because they are greedy. I mean, they're greedy as well, but that's not the number one reason. It's also that they just have a cost infrastructure that needs to get multiple percentage mm. points out of every client every year. And um, yeah, so my biggest advice would be that um, even if you cannibalize your business, even if your revenues go down short or medium term, it's, it's just what you have to do. Otherwise, uh, someone else will do it. And Professor Ernst. What should companies do first when developing their digitization strategy? Um, first of all, I totally agree uh, with Dr. Kupitz. So um, I think that um, keeping in mind what your actual business is all about is essential and is very crucial in order to really create value for your customers. 
um, when I talk with companies recently, they all tell me about digitalization, maybe of automation, automation, but they're not really thinking about what would be the best for their current business. How could they actually use technology in order to create value for themselves and in order to create value for their customers? And also, what I think, um, which is a little bit in contrast um, of what, what your company is doing, is that um, we should not forget about the people inside the company. So Industry 4.0 is a big topic, not only in Germany at the moment, with this big uh, term, automation. And, but I think that we still need people, and I think we will need, in the near to long future, still need people to, for doing tasks. And people are only, uh, every time, having some kind of resistance against technology change. So when we're doing tech digitalization, we have to take the people that are working currently at our companies into the boat and listen to their fears and listen to their concerns. And in order to make our business better through technology together with people. So I think this would be the way Andrew. to go. Yeah. And, and I heard the word fear from uh, two panelists. I think this is um, actually crucial and, and Beth also talked about it uh, in context of G. I see it all the time. So um, I once said that if you ask a manager um, how to launch a new product, he will, a great manager usually will come with 10 valid reasonable excuses not to do it versus an entrepreneur will usually come with one way to, to do it, right? That's, that's the big difference. And so if you've got great managers, they always have very valid and reasonable answers of why something is impossible. You have to take it into mind and you have to, uh, be because of that and through that, you have to figure out how to build a culture where you can fail fast, if you will. Um, it becomes super important. So if you want to use that fear to your advantage, there you have to look at two things. One is your customers and two is your velocity. If you are addressing your real customer problems, if they resonate, and if you can validate that quickly, your game. Um, and if one of those two components are missing, if you're just doing digitization for the sake of digitization, or if you're doing it slower than your competition, if you're not validating it fast enough, if you're shipping it uh, later to the market, if you're not um, cannibalizing yourself in time, um, then you're, um, you might lose their, the market share. Christoph Holz, what should companies do first when developing this digitization strategy? I think they should um, experience it. They experience it? Experience it, yeah. They really should try out and, and do experiments and try different approaches. I don't believe there is a, a, a recipe for any company how to do it. If companies, on the other hand, all companies would do it the same way, then some of these companies would be obsolete. So I think the, the very tailored digitalization strategy has to be at the core of the company to, be, uh, to have added value. Digitalization means usually the winner takes it all. You have distribution channels globally. Uh, you have uh, a very transparent market. So um, I, I, I know a company in Austria, Swarovski, they put a lot of money in their SAP development, uh, ERP, SAP, and, and I asked them why you could just use the, the, the standard solution. They said, no, we can't. If this does not represent our very individual processes, we will be obsolete ones. What are currently the biggest showstoppers for companies to digitize their business? Security standards? Data protection rules. What do you think? Dr. Mindset. Kirpich. I would say mindset. You, you say the mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of barriers, and they depend on the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, some industries have a lot of security issues. You know, when you when you track people in retail and you track them across web pages, there's not a lot of security issues. You know? So, I think that you cannot map it down to one data silo or one aspects of data. It's more like the overall mindset, yeah. I mean, it's there is a lot of eat your own dog food. You know, if you if you don't uh, do and live what you preach by yourselves, mm -hmm. you know, then um, mm. it's difficult. Yeah. So the companies, I think, the internal hindrance 
uh, especially in large mature companies, comes more from management and layer one, layer two than from you know any kind of aspect of technology that you can could not solve. I think there's only very few items that are unsolvable for co some company. I think um, it's not understanding mobile um, because I mean it's 2016, so the. Um, a lot of things w uh, that we talk about when we mean digitalization that has arrived in big companies. Yeah? So they all have, banks have online banking, you can do your um, transfers uh, digitally. But um, what has really, really changed, especially in the last four, five, six years dramatically, is that the internet for most people is this. Yeah? This is their number one portal. Yeah? Um, much more so in, in emerging markets. People don't even have a computer. And a lot of companies don't understand mobile. And what I mean by that is um, they understand that it's important that you use it, but they still, the way they develop it. So if you go into even um, e-commerce companies that have been around for a couple of years, um, the developers and de designers sit in front of 21-inch uh, uh, Mac uh, um, screens, and um, the mobile version is just a compressed version of this. This is not how mobile works. And also what mobile has solved, um, specifically in industries that depended on an inconvenience factor because historically it was just very inconvenient to use 10 different banks or 10 different financial services from 10 different banks yeah because they had to gather the same information again it was very inconvenient now it's just a click away yeah i want to send money i do this with paypal i want to convert uh, currencies, I do this with TransferWise. I want to invest, invest I'll, I'll do it with the next step. It's just one click away. So it's, you have that one convenience hub within, within, within this piece. And a lot of companies who have made the first step, like the, you can call it Internet 1.0, but um, they haven't done the, the, the mobile step. And the companies that you see in a lot of spaces that have the, the most tremendous growth are mobile first or sometimes even mobile only companies. Instagram didn't even have a, a desktop application, didn't even have a website after they had a couple of hundred million uh, people on their platforms already. So I think it's, it goes more and more into that this will be the number one place where you connect to the digital world. I see you nodding. You're yeah, I think the other aspect we, which we haven't talked about in this round, which, which shocks me a little bit, is we speak about digitization like uh, doing the same thing in, in a digitized way. Yeah. But I think one of the big challenges is where is the net new idea? You know, imagine you're a company, okay, and you're talking about digitization. I think one of the questions you should ask yourself, what is going to change? What is going to be different? Am I going to do more, more business? Right? And am I changing some aspect of my business or coming up with a complete new idea that wasn't there and it's done because of digitization? Yeah, I mean, I think that should be the aspiration. If you just have the aspiration to say, I'm going to save money, it's going to be more efficient, I'm going to have more reach, more scalability, that's all fine. <coughs> but I think the real aspect of that is uh, you know, maybe like blockchain in banking. I mean, it might completely disrupt the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the classic bank with all the regulations might, you know, might be different, not disappear, but might be completely different. And I think that's the, the thing that if you're a company, you, think of, you have to think about that. Does it really change my business completely? Like take um, you know, these large turbine producers um, on the planes. Today, yes. for example, in the old days, you would buy a turbine. It's very expensive. So it's completely uh, CapEx driven. Okay? You buy 20 million, you spend the money, you get the turbine, you get service. Today, some of these companies already go by the hour. You don't own the turbine anymore. You don't need to 20 million. You pay by the hour, okay? So at the end of every month, you say, I flew 5,000 hours times X makes so much pay. Okay, so changing your business fundamentally and being much more attractive to a customer who says, wow, that's an attractive model because I don't need that, that, you know, that cash anymore. You know? mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What well, are show stoppers that come to your mind? Reasons why people say, oh no, not, not now, not with me, not here. I think that's not secure. I think that one problem might be how many companies today operate. So I think that one of the most important success factors, again, are the people and people's knowledge as well as their creativity, which is going in basically the same direction what you were saying just some time ago. So we have people and we have technology. And 
every company today is able to buy this technology and each and every one is able to have a website to do, to do with this uh, social media marketing. But in order to do it in a special way, in a way that it creates value for yourself and for your customers again, is very, very important. So let me maybe um, paint you a picture. Um, I think everybody knows Lego these little pieces which we grew build up with together. So maybe you played with it or maybe your, your kids or grandparents play with it. So everybody is able to go to the shop and buy, it, buy these little bricks, buy its servers, buy thin clients, buy fat clients, buy cloud computing solutions. But how to create something bigger, how to create something spectacular with these little pieces that every company has is the main thing. And there you need creativity. You need to give people the, the air to breathe, the order to be creative and in order to do create something individual. And I think that this might also be a good way to maybe mitigate this showstopper. Create, cr give people room to breathe, to be creative, to build something individual and to build something special value creating. Mm -hmm. Andrew, tell me more about the naysayers you've met. No, I think <laughs> the, uh, the co-panelists covered it pretty well. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, other topic, in consumer-oriented business segments, digital disruption has often led to an oligopoly. A, a few platforms dominate the global market. Is this an inherent effect of all digital transformation? I, I can take this one. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I do think it's uh, to some degree the case for, for better or worse. Um, the reason being is um, digital distribution is very, very cheap. So if, you gather, if somebody has a competitive advantage, they usually capitalize on it very quickly um, and it's hard to catch up. And you see this mm. all the time with um, and, and again, it's not monopoly. I think their oligopoly is the right word, right? So you've got messaging apps. There are only a handful there. There are right now maybe thousand startups, but they're only like you can count them, on, you know, on one or two hands. They're the ones that matter. Same with Uber, right? There are maybe one or two local competitors in each country, but uh, Uber is the $50 billion company and nothing else comes close. There's um, same with Airbnb and so on. So usually you do see that. Um, now, uh, to, to some degree, you might say, well, we're all doomed because it's not free market anymore. Like, what, what do we do with that? Um, on the other hand, it's not the case. Um, and the reason is um, those companies get disrupted as well. And that's kind of how you should think about it. Uh, there's a good story about competition between Blockbuster and Netflix where... Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, Blockbuster was the retail chain for, for rentals. Netflix came out with this DVD by mail thing, uh, which you can consider kind of a disruption, right? And so Blockbuster was trying to compete and catch up with Netflix uh, by doing the same thing, uh, while Netflix CEO openly said that this is not a smart idea because Netflix was already looking at the next frontier, which is online video and where the battle is today. So Blockbuster wanted to stay in business. They shouldn't have tried to catch up, um, being sort of three or four years behind, they should have leapfrogged and looked at the next opportunity. So if you're running your business and you got a competitor that's very early in the market, um, mm -hmm. put all, all into trying to beat them, and that's why velocity is important. If they're so far away from you that you know, you're know you kind of a couple of years behind, the better strategy might be to try to leapfrog them all the way. And again, at the mega uh, trends level. You see it um, in mobile, you see it in banking, where in some emerging countries, you know, they didn't go to laptops, they jumped right into mobile. In some payments industry, some emerging countries, like in the United States, for example, we still use checks. Whereas in a lot of countries, they, they kind of completely jumped over that stage. They didn't have checks, they ju jumped directly into um, online transfers. And I think in countries like Africa, they might jump directly into mobile transfers mm -hmm. uh, right away. So that opportunity to leapfrog is something that uh, we should all be watching for. We'll have a talk later about uh, mobile payment that's already working in, in Kenya. So if you're interested in that, just stick around. It'll be in an hour or something. I mean, I completely agree on the strategy, um, leapfrogging. My, my, my question is just if incumbents can actually do that. Because out of my head, I can't no. recall a single one who could do it. No. Yeah, it's rather new companies 
Netflix is not the right example here because they did it themselves. It would rather Microsoft be did it with, uh, remember their internet memo from Bill Gates back, back in the day. So, so I agree yeah. with you. Usually it's very hard. Uh, the Innovator's yeah. Dilemma by Christensen yeah. covers mm. pretty well. Uh, usually they fail, but, but there are good, good examples. Okay. That can do okay. Because that's, that's, I mean, um, apart from those examples, that's what always strikes me, that if a truly new disruptive technology comes up, it's, it's, it's almost never the incumbent who succeeds, is, who succeeds yeah. with it. Hmm. Um, even though, for looking from the outside, it's just a very small step. Yeah? For Barnes & Noble's waterfront, like the big book resellers in America, they just had to build a website. They had everything. They had the contracts, they had the books, they had the, the authors, everything. The, the logistics. Amazon had to build everything from the ground to get there. But they were, they were still beaten by Amazon. You see this in lots of lots of lots of other fields mm. that these new companies, even though they have, and the website is just the smallest part of that, the, the, they have to build everything in the back as well, and they still succeed against the incumbents. This is what always strikes me. Mm -hmm. Don't really have an explanation for that, but I, that's, uh, that's what really strikes me in that I, field. I could try to provide an explanation because the. Uh, the successful solutions might be one out of thousand. And so you need thousand startups to have one successful startup. Mm -hmm. and, someone, and so the incumbent cannot pick one of these thousand solutions and know in advance what will be the good idea. It has yeah. to be an experiment. And it has to relay on need. Someone told me, I'm a startup entrepreneur, he told me, how can you do this? Innovation only comes out of need. War as the uh, mother of all uh, inventions. So I now know startups are an artificial way of creating a need, creating a, a difficult situation, a harsh situation for an entrepreneur to make him innovative. And that's why incumbents, even if it's the same person, they get a check every month, uh, and they go on holidays and everything, they can't be innovative. Mm. You really have to be in a painful situation. <laughs> that's right. I agree. So go ahead. I that's what startups. No, that's my definition I mean, of startups. Look, look, I mean, in a startup, you. Uh, I mean, he said this rightly. You have to build up. Uh, I'm sometimes stunned how this happens. I mean, how can you, if you have a great idea, and I'm always happy when it's fully digitized and you have no logistics. But once the moment you have any piece of logistics in there, I mean, it's complicated stuff. Yeah. I mean, you have warehouses and 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 delivery, and you have to get this all done. But the point is, if you have a great idea, you can attract great talents. They have upsides, you know, there's, there's, there's something in for them. If you're working for a large retailer, unless they're very smart, there's not, you know, you've got a safe job, but there is no upside. There is no, there's no, you know, both on the creativity and on a personal kind of career path, there's not much they can offer you because they're bound into the systems with levers and hierarchies and, and whatever. It's difficult to challenge them. I mean, take Nestle with Nespresso. Mm -hmm. That's a good example, by yeah, the way. Nestle is. and Nespresso. Nespresso, uh, from what I recall, up to this very day, it's still a completely separate company. They can do whatever they want. They have their own IT infrastructure, their own ways of doing business, because they knew if we would launch this Nespresso thing out of Nestle, it might work, but it might also not work. So Nestle itself, the, the management of Nestle knew that it works if we don't touch it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Let the child go Let yes. these guys and just go. don't yes. be in their way. And they had yes. this brutal thing that you can't, literally can't buy the stuff if you're not registered, right? Kind of, mm -hmm. right? So you have to kind of register somehow mm -hmm. if you want to buy the stuff. And it worked out. And It, it was the third idea. Yeah. yeah. Every other idea before that with Nestle, it was a bust. Oh, they tried other things before? Yes, they did. Oh, yeah, and uh, one of the biggest innovations from Austria is Red Bull. Yeah. You know, yeah, uh, Dietrich yeah. Mateschitz. And he tried after that 10 more things. And everyone was a bust. He had this one hit wonder. So entrepreneurship, I think the compa every company is a one hit wonder. Because if you have an infrastructure, you lose the ability to innovate. Because you would, you, if, if you want to innovate, you have to risk it all. And if you can't afford to risk it because you already have employees and family and... And stakeholders and, and you know, whatever. You yeah. can't be innovative anymore yeah. because innovation is a crude thing. It's painful. Yeah, I <laughs> agree. Is that your experience too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in all the companies I've been working and small, large, 
if you you know if you have quarterly deliverables, people look at you on a quarterly base. Yeah, and then you end up, and I think, as you said, that's maybe the chance for any company to be killed in the good way. You know, like any company can be killed somewhere down the road. You know, even the ones where we, we think today they're unkillable. And this because concept... Because they get complacent, <coughs> they get slower, the hierarchies are growing, and, mm -hmm. and in there, innovation, it's still there, but it, it, it diminishes over time. Yeah, and, yeah. I talked about this economist, Joseph Schumpeter, who is an Austrian, um, and he came up with the concept 100 years ago about creative destruction. And he always says, economy is about destruction. So you build a big company and it has to be destroyed. And from the Fortune 500 companies in the US, only 100 companies, 500 companies, from the beginning of this index, only one company still remains, General Electric. Yeah. Only one company survives. It's, it's, it, it even has been with the steam engine, the steamboats, when they were invented, all the big uh, uh, builders of, of the sail ships, they tried this technology, but it would not work overseas, and they had these big ships, and, they, and there was enough wind. And uh, the steamboats solved a different problem. They went upstream. They could drive up the rivers. Uh, which uh, you could not sail them, you would have to use horses. And after that, sometimes later they became uh, uh, able to go over the sea. And then all the producers of sail ships, they died. They had tried it, they had disproved it, and then when they saw the steamboats going over the oceans, they were not able to, uh, to compete. All of them got uh, bust. Mm -hmm. Now let's come to something very everyday life. Bring your own device. Um, I remember a time 15 years ago when our employer offered us mobile phones. And we said, every one of us are like, we don't want your phone, I've got mine. I won't even change my number. It would have been nice, they would have paid for it. We didn't even want that. That was 15 years ago. What is your experience in their company? Do people bring their own laptops or do they use the ones they find? It's a security matter also. Mm. Can you attach your personal laptop with all the private fun you have on that to the system of the company? What's your experience? Will we keep using the office computers or will there be a time when really, like everyone in the creative industry, they bring their MacBook or If they bring their laptop? Mm. If, they, if my employees don't bring their own device, I buy them one and give it to them. They have to use it on, on their own, which is very, um, a very um, creepy idea because they tend to use it for work at home and won't write the, number, the, the hours down. So I get more out of it. <laughs> <coughs> and, and, uh, and, and if they leave the company, they can leave with this device. We would not want to give another employee the old device. And uh, rather soon, I'm going to get implement, uh, uh, implanted all these devices. So my mobile phone in my teeth, for example, so <laughs> how should this be done with m my company's devices? Of course, I bring my own body. We're actually, we're actually getting rid of uh, most hardware components. Uh, in general, we are um, using more and more um, virtual desktop connections, which means you don't actually have a computer. You don't have any possibility to store anything locally. It's just a connection tool to connect you to a, a cloud-based service. And the reason why we do this is mainly, is one is cost, and the other is so all the computing happens in the cloud, nothing locally, and the other is security, because most, or the biggest security risk, or most of the security leaks also that you've seen in the press, are not necessarily that you are attacked from the outside or a foreign state. It's, it's, it's a lot of the times it's the, it's, it comes from the inside, employees, um, even at the NSA, steal the data. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we don't offer any possibility to store anything locally. The, the only portal that you have is a device that connects you to a cloud-based service. So to answer your questions, um, um, this whole concept of ownership of a computer that actually gets, uh, at least uh, on a, in, in our company, that, that get, gets obsolete. Before I get more answers from you, I would like to ask the audience, Who uses a company computer? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Who okay. uses their own computer for work with the company? Ah, three, 
three and a half, okay. Who uses the company mobile phone? Who uses their own mobile phone for the company? Uh, maybe a third, maybe one of four. You're not journalists. <laughs> <laughs> You're not in the computer business. You're not in the communication business. Otherwise, you'd not touch any other people's phones or, or, or computers. Now, what is your prediction? Um, Gartner has a great term. They call it bimodal IT. So they uh, look at how I IT management and company switches from this top-down approach mm. into two different modes that are very, very different. So the top-down still makes a lot of sense and should be there. There are some basic services. Uh, for example, your authentication technology should be pre-vetted, should be consistently deployed, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, a, in order to move fast, and this goes back to innovation and velocity and everything else, you have to allow your employees to bring their own devices and bring their own applications into work. If you think about it, uh, I think bring your own application is even much more important than bring your own device. Because devices, you know, you've got Apple, you've got Samsung, you've got Google, uh, you've got Microsoft. There's not that many choices versus applications. There are literally hundreds of them. And they actually uh, not as commoditized as devices. So they do make a big difference in productivity. And as an IT team that's sort of centralized and oversees 20,000 employees, you can hardly know what you know, the guy in Bangalore really needs to get his job done, right? So uh, it makes sense to let your employees sort of crowdsource and pre-vet the best tools and then put them through centralized IT to make sure that they're secure and sort of you get a good deal and legally it's correct. So those two modes, I think that's where we're heading. Um, internally within the company, we use the same approach. Um, and kind of uh, resonating. We're not on virtual terminal terminals, but um, everything that we run with is on the cloud. I cannot imagine, like when if the vendor says you got to buy a server and put it in the closet, I look at them as like, what's going on here? So, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kirby, before you answer, I would like to walk around with a mic and allow you to ask a few questions that might pop to your mind. You never have an occasion. There is the first one. They're all for free now, and you're yours. Oh, um, testing. Yours. Okay. Uh, Dr. Holtz, you said that um, a big company with uh, infrastructure can innovate because they have to risk everything to do so. Um, I come from San Diego, California. There's a huge company that you might, some of you might know called Intuit. Um, they constantly invite um, Eric Rice, uh, the, the writer of Lean uh, the Lean Startup. Yeah. And um, they innovate from within. I'm not very familiar on what they innovate on, mm -hmm. but it's, I mean, it's definitely, you know, uh, their business model or, or products or, I mean, but, I, but they, man they manage to do so somehow. Uh, how do you think they manage to do it and why do you think other companies can't do that? I believe in the core of innovation is, it's, it's a basic <laughs> human need and, and you want to do it for yourself. That's why startups really work and why you put a lot more work in a startup why you are willing to exploit yourself. And I don't think a company could pay anyone to exploit themselves because it would not be exploitation anymore if they got paid. So I think that's the core reason why a company, even if they say like Google, you take 10% of your time and do something you, you like. If it's not your own, you don't put anything in it you have. And you won't be able to compete with people who put everything in they have, even if only 1% of all the startups succeed. And I'm familiar with Intuit a little bit. So one is that um, there is a good top-down support for that. So for example, they had a company-wide Design for Delight, I think, initiative. It's what they called. Um, so, so there is a belief in their execs and management and that it makes difference. And they're also practice customer centric. So for example, I once talked to one of their UX guys about how they deployed their desktop version of their product, of the cloud, cloud product. They have a cloud offering and they cloud first offering that they wanted to deploy to desktop and they had their own idea, but then they went to customers. And after several services, they actually completely changed the paradigm of what they were supposed to deliver. They so they pivoted. Huh? They pivoted. Well, it's I wouldn't call it a pivot. That's that's an overloaded word. Um, I would just say that they better matched their resources with customer needs and were able to very quickly launch very successful product. 
I don't think employees can innovate. That's it. Stephen Jobs <laughs> was very in innovative and he risked Apple all the time and he risked all his other companies. He just did it and, and tried it out and he could have failed and his company could have gone bust. And I think uh, uh, Bill Gates once bailed him out, didn't he? So I think only entrepreneurs can be truly innovative. Yeah, that's it. You may hit me now. Gentlemen, thank, thank you, so you very much. much. It's been very inspiring. We could have, we, I could go on for another 20 minutes, <laughs> but I'm already 10 minutes way over the time. <laughs> Andrew Feilev, Christoph Holz, Erik Potzuwald, Professor Ernst and Dr. Kubrick, thank you very much. Thank you.